So this is um, two a video of two athletes carrying out uh, double leg counter movement jumps and double leg drop jumps. Um, one at approximately four and a half months post ACL reconstruction, the other one at approximately uh, seven months. And what myself and Rula would like to, to highlight here is all the various pieces of information that you can get from looking at the performance variables and the ground reaction force curves during a double leg jumps. And obviously you can extend that to single leg jumps and horizontal jumps as well. And obviously that's without getting into a joint by joint uh, analysis uh, and approach. So and we start off with this first athlete who's about four and a half months post reconstruction. This is their double leg counter movement uh, force variables. Uh, using four stacks, we we have four key variables highlighted here from a performance point of view. Number one is their peak eccentric velocity, so that's the speed at which they're they're dipping into the counter movement, and that's really just to to interpret you know their intensity or the speed of their counter movement. Are they very slow? Are they even dipping at all? And is it more of a squat jump? And you're looking for something in the region of one point one or one point two or greater meters per second so a little slow in the first jump but certainly quicker and, and, and nice intensity and in, on the second and third jump the second thing we're going to have a look at is their jump height so again producing somewhere in the region of 40 centimeters across all those jumps so, so quite good this was a, a football or soccer player so quite good double leg counter movement jump heights similarly when we look at the rsi uh, modified um, quite good values there up into the 0.6s, which is, is, is quite a, a high level uh, and peak power in, in the 60 watt per kilo. So again, if you look only at the performance variables here, you'd say, look at the, the very happy deceler dipping into the counter movement at speed and producing very good um, uh, performance metrics. When we go to look at uh, the ground reaction force curves, uh, the blue is their left leg, the orange is their right leg and their operated side. And what you'll see that in the counter movement, so a nice steady um, state before we start, as they dip, their eccentric deceleration forces are, are greater on the healthy side than the operated side. Their push-off forces are greater on the healthy side than the, than the operated side. And there's a fairly notable asymmetry on the landing for the counter movement jump. Um, so that's trial number one. Trial number two, again, probably a little bit less steady at the start, which we have to keep in mind. Again, quite happy to decelerate nice intensity or dip to the counter movement. Um, but those asymmetries in the eccentric phase becoming evident, ongoing evidence in the push-off phase and that asymmetry magnified again in the landing. So whether it's jump one, two, or three, certainly the, the thing you can see here is, although there's an asymmetry, I mean, they're very happy pushing off. There's good triple extension there. You can see them completing the push off uh, even more so on the operate side than the non-operate side, but the ability to produce force is definitely diminished eccentrically, whether that's in the counter movement or in the landing and concentrically as well. So here's someone who, from a rehabilitation point of view, is, is producing very good numbers. Um, but when you look at the force generation, one side compared to the other in the counter movement jump, there's definitely room for development. And that's borne out when we look at the at the impulse asymmetry. So when we look at the eccentric impulse asymmetry, on average, about a 20% asymmetry. Uh, when you look at the concentric impulse asymmetry, about 20% asymmetry. When you look at the, at the second phase of the impulse asymmetry, or concentric impulse asymmetry, where the asymmetries often are greater, up to 25%. And again, the landing is where often the greatest asymmetries are evident up on 35%. And we, we'd be looking for not only less than 10% um, to, to be normal, but to have a degree of variance. When, when, when healthy people land, they don't tend to, well, you know, they may have a, an asymmetry up, of up to 10%. That asymmetry often changes between legs all the time, whereas when you're coming back from an injury, in particular an ACL, they tend to persistently have deficits on one side compared to the other. So, um. Performance-wise, very good. Asymmetry-wise, some areas for development concentrically and eccentrically. When we come to the same athlete's double leg drop jump, um, again, you're looking for ground contact times less than 0.3, I mean, in, in elite level, around 0.2. So again, very acceptable levels and, and warming up or speeding up as, as they go along, shorter ground contact times. 
when you look at the jump heights again very you know a relatively explosive athlete into the 30 centimeters for the for the double leg uh drop jump uh, your rsi um which is your jump height divided by your ground contact time i'm um, in an ideal world for field athletes you, you'd like to be into the 0.5s and 1.5s and higher obviously track and field athletes are going to have a much higher level of competency uh, in plyometric exercises than, than field sport athletes so um, an area for some general development probably by shortening the ground contact time a little bit more and, and improving the jump height a little bit so we know they're explosive but their plyometric capacity mind me doesn't just match their explosiveness and uh, that we saw on the counter movement jump and um, generally Whatever asymmetries you see in a counter movement jump are often you know, magnified quite a lot in a, a drop jump. So we can see a number of really interesting pieces of information here. Number one is, is the obvious force asymmetry between the operated side and the non-operated side. The second thing is an ideal you know, theoretical curve is one that absorbs and pushes off. You can see here that the peak is certainly uh, early and this dip, there's this dip here where often the, the knee translates into flexion before pushing off again. So you see the knee buckling forward and pushing off, and that's on the left hand side, and a huge unweighting of the the operated side. So that's trial number one. And um, you'd have expected a greater degree of asymmetry here, not so much in trial number one, certainly more evident in trial number two. And there's a lot of pieces here. You'll see very often the heel is striking the ground. You'll see they're landing quite rigidly. So you get this early peak. So it makes your rate of force development look good, whatever whatever good is. But actually what's happening is they're, they're landing very rigidly because they don't have the capacity. As so you get this early spike in range, you get this buckling of the knee forward and then a push off again on trial two. And again, large asymmetries on trial three. So we can see both in the quality of the ground contact and the asymmetry of the ground contact, there's definitely a lot of areas for development. Again, very early, only four and a half months post-surgery, but um, lots of room for development with this athlete. Um, and those asymmetries are borne out uh, when we look at the overall metrics. So eccentric impulse, 35%, concentric impulse, 27%, uh, landing force asymmetries, uh, whether it's peak, um, uh, or in, whether it's impact or landing, again, you're looking in the region of somewhere between 30 and, and, and almost 35% asymmetry. So lots of work to do there. So if I summarize this athlete, you'd say someone that's very explosive, um, but persistent asymmetries and the ability to absorb and push off. And those asymmetries are even more evident in the drop jump than they are in the counter movement jump. And you'll often find the drop jump testing is the last jump performance test to, 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 to resolve um, during the ACL pathway. Um, if we come to our second athlete, who's a little bit further on on their journey, um, and we look at their double lug counter movement jump, again, you'll see their eccentric impulses, or their, sorry, their peak eccentric velocity is faster than the previous athlete. So they've done a lot of training in, in landing and in, in counter moving at, at, at this stage. So they're in the 1.4s. Um, if you look at their jump heights, not as high, or their RSI modified, not as high as the previous athlete. Um, and relatively good peak power again for a, for for a footballer, and um, it's when we look at the at the counter movement, jump force curves, and um, we can see a couple of interesting points here. Again, probably the asymmetries are far less obvious uh, in this athlete. They they are are loading much more equally uh, during the eccentric phase, during the concentric phase, and during the landing in in jump one, uh, in jump two. And jump three, and um, certainly much more even distribution. What is also interesting is when you look at the shape of the curves, how they're probably not maximizing the push off the way athlete one was, even though athlete one had much greater asymmetries. So rather than having this nice push off here, especially in the second phase of the uh, concentric impulse, and um, there's definitely a, a lack of, of 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 consistency in how they're pushing off. Again, nice counter movement but there's the curb is not showing this ongoing triple extension ongoing push off in trial two or in trial three so again this is an athlete who's probably um more symmetrical but has some overall development in both their mechanics but also their overall performance levels but certainly for seven to a half months in terms of meeting our criteria for progression they're, they're very uh, in a very good place so um 
we'll see here that the eccentric deceleration is, is less than 10% and has some natural variance between sides. The concentric impulse, uh, again, on the non-operate side is a little bit better, uh, but getting in around the 10% mark. Um, however, again, you can see in the second part of the concentric impulse, or the second that that asymmetry is greater. So it's often the, the phase two of the concentric impulse here, where they, we don't finish off the push off on our operate side. That's often where this asymmetry can be greater than looking at the concentric impulse alone. And again, our, our average landing impulse asymmetry is just 6% and there's a natural variance there side to side. So um, again, much closer towards end stage, but needing to work on that, on that push off a little bit um, on, on the operated side still. When we look at our drop jumps, again, fairly average ground contact times for the double leg drop jumps. Um, jump heights, again, fairly okay, somewhere in the region of the 30%. There, there are as I... Jump height divided by ground contact time is, is probably more advanced. You can see that they were probably warming up as this testing session went on. Um, ground contact times were reduced here, which is why you get the higher RSI in this last um, in this last effort, despite fairly consistent uh, peak power outputs. But somewhere in the region of you know 1.2 to 1.4, 1.3 is is better than the previous athlete, and probably somewhere where we'd still like to see ongoing development. You can see again here. The shape of the curve tells us lots of very, very interesting information. Um, their landing impulse is, is fairly similar on jump one, jump two, and jump three. However, it seems to be on, on the push off here, you see that they, again, there's a slightly rigid landing heel striking the ground. You get this shunting forward of the tibia, so you land and the knee buckles forward before you push off. And again, that concentric push off there is a, quite a noticeable difference. Again, a relatively rigid landing and then a, a reduction in push off, a relatively rigid landing, you get that early spike and then this is just a struggle to, to utilize that stretch shortening cycle as efficiently as possible. And um, so again, the asymmetries are probably less evident. That's probably as they're, as they're warming up, the, the curves are getting closer. And um, the asymmetries in the eccentric phase are, are less obvious, but actually, that's probably not telling a very, very true story because what you're seeing here, seeing here is quite quite a rigid landing. And because I'm not efficiently absorbing force, I really struggle then during my drop jump to push off. So we're seeing quite, quite large, up to 25% uh, impulse asymmetries, despite the fact that the landing uh, force and the landing impact force um, are are really beginning to normalize and get and get towards you know less than two percent, which isn't what we're talking about. So, um, again, a lot of very useful information there. I think overall you'd say that that athlete is improving well. There's probably some deficits in their stretch shortening cycle. That means that even though they they land or their eccentric impulse is relatively symmetrical, they're really struggling to transfer that into a push off afterwards. And that's evident in the shape of the curves as well as the number. So again, it's always that combination of looking at your performance variables and um, your asymmetries and your ground reaction force curves that allow you to have the most complete picture of where the athlete's at and allow you to be really um, targeted in your interpretation of the results and the ensuing intervention as well. So hopefully you'll find this of use. Uh, it shows that the value of looking at biomechanics and ground reaction force curves in addition to performance variables and that even though someone can jump very high and um, a lot of force deficits are hidden by the by the overall jump performance uh, and again i said that's without looking at a giant by giant approach you'd imagine that there'll be knee extension deficits and and perhaps ankle plantar flexion moment deficits in these athletes as well so hope you found this of use and um, if you have any questions feel free to drop myself or rula a line at any stage thank you